for those of you who know a little bit about my story, I secular Jew and I became a Seventh-day Adventist. And you have no idea of the vast, vast, vast chasms that I had to cross to become, you know, from being a secular Jew to an Adventist. In a sense, I had to be broken, broken into tiny little pieces and put back together again to make it fit. And I think if you'd ask the folks at the GC who know me, they'd probably wonder, even after 26 years there, how good of a fit it really is. And it's not so easy on both sides. I mean, for you adjusting to Adventism. I mean, so many Republicans. And I had to say that, I had to razz Justin McNeilis on that a little bit on that. Though I'm sure my wife is probably on home watching this on the computer, shaking her head and saying, oh no, Cliff, don't go down that road, don't do that. But anyway, the point though, the point though in all this, is whatever the cultural differences or whatever, the bottom line is, folks, you're stuck with me because I can't be anything else other than a Seventh-day Adventist. But now, there's, here's the thing. There's just one reason and one reason alone that I'm an Adventist. One reason and one reason alone that I'm here, and that's the doctrines. That's the teachings of this church. I believe that this is present truth and that no one else in the world is preaching this message. You know, with all due respect, no one else is even coming close to this. I talked about that in my seminar on the remnant. It's these truths, these wonderful present truths that we have been given. This is what keeps me here and nothing else. Else. We're not all going to see things the same way. But the question I ask, the question I'm asking is, at what point, at what point does somebody hold some beliefs that just cross a line, that cross a line and take them out of the fellowship? At what point you can say, we love you, we care about you, but you have crossed a line. And folks, if evolution hasn't crossed that line, nothing has. If evolution, nothing has. I mean, to think that, you, I mean, to me, to think that you can meld the teachings of evolution with Adventism, it's surreal to me. It's surreal to me. You can't be an evolutionist and a Seventh-day Adventist. Pick one, pick the other but have the moral honesty and integrity and the intellectual honesty and integrity to not perpetrate the myth that you can do both. You know, I've done, you've all heard of the new atheists, these writers, I've read all, I've read all of them. Uh, Sam Harris, Christopher Hitchens, Richard Dawkins, Daniel Dennett. You know, and Dawkins is by far my favorite. He's hilarious. This book, The God Delusion, was very well written. It was funny. I mean, I enjoyed every minute of it. I mean, the arguments, I mean, he's a great writer. And I really think Richard Dawkins is someone who's fighting conviction. I really think he is. I mean, his arguments against the existence of God, they were juvenile. It's, you know, it's like, you know, was it who invented, who created God, that kind of thing. But Dawkins had one point that he was very clear on. Dawkins was clear. He had nothing but disdain. He had nothing but disdain for the scientists who claim to be evolutionists and yet at the same time claim to be Christians. He called them, he called them the Neville Chamberlain School of Science. And you know, he was honest enough Dawkins was honest enough to see that evolution destroys everything that the Bible stands for. And it's pretty sad when Richard Dawkins, whom I kind of call him the Muhammad Atta of the, of the atheist apologetics, when he's got more intellectual honesties than, than some professed Seventh-day Adventists. But people say, it's science, Cliff, it's science. 
I'd say to somebody, if you're struggling with these issues, if you're struggling with the lure, and I know the power and the lure of that, I plead in the name of Jesus, spend some time, spend some time reading the philosophy of science. It's fascinating to read the philosophy of sciences. Scientists disagree on even what science is. They disagree on, you know, whether it's what is science compared to pseudoscience, compared to good science, compared to bad science. They don't agree. They disagree on what constitutes a scientific proof. They disagree on whether science can ever really prove anything. Some say yes, some say no. They disagree on whether empirical evidence, raw data, can ever even prove a theory. They disagree of any, whether any evidence can ever be called raw data at all. They disagree on the, the scientific method. They sometimes even dif disagree if there's anything even call, anything really you could even call a scientific method. So these fundamental teachings of science are blatantly in contradiction of each other. So the question is, and meanwhile, we have folks that are going to make a shipwreck of their faith or lead our young people to perdition based on some fanciful speculation about what happened to some, to some supposed proto-RNA, you know, in the African savanna 2.5 billion years ago. If you're struggling with this, I plead, think through the implications of this. If evolution's too true, if evolution's how we got here, the book of Genesis is a joke. If you can read evolution into Genesis, I can read Marxism, reincarnation, and voodoo into it as well. Think of the mockery it makes of the plan of salvation. How does this work again? God uses a process of violence, selfishness, and dominance of the strong against the weak in order to create a morally flawless being who falls into a state of violence, selfish, and dominance of the strong over the weak, a state from which he has to be redeemed from or else face final punishment. Bible tells me Christ came to destroy death, the very means that God used to create life to begin with. Can someone please explain to me how that works? And then how do you fit the second coming in, the promise of the... How do you fit evolution in with the second coming and the resurrection of the dead? Hey, folks, most of the dead are pretty far gone. They're pretty far gone. Is God going to, resurrection going to be a divine fiat? Is it going to be in the twinkling of an eye? Or are we going to get to go through the joys and rigors of survival of the fittest and random mutation and on and on and on for a few billion years like the first time until we finally get a new world, one wherein dwelleth righteousness? Evolution destroys everything we believe in, everything we stand for. So I plead with anybody, any young person, your struggling, old person, whatever, it doesn't matter, think through the implications of this. You know, a number of years ago, I wrote an article. I wrote an article called Seventh-day Darwinians. And in it, I made a point that I thought was so obvious, I thought it was almost redundant. And in it, I made the point was that if you truly believe in evolution, don't you think the only honest thing to do would be to take your conclusions, your, your views to their logical conclusion, and not remain in a church whose very name, Seventh-day Adventist, denies the whole idea of evolution? Is it too much to ask someone who takes the name Seventh-day Adventist to at least believe in what the name itself stands for.